guys, welcome back to the channel. So, I have a rule that whenever somebody offers you something for free, I always take it because if they if you say no, they'll quit offering you stuff. And so I always take it, even if that means that I just take it to the dump for them. Um, so uh, now I have a friend of mine that was downsizing his house, and uh, him and his wife retire or are retiring, and uh, so he's downsizing. And so he starts giving me a bunch of old tools because he can't fit them in his new garage because they moved into a smaller house in this subdivision. So now I've got even more tools on the workbench behind me. I'm trying to get cleaned up. It's impossible to get a workbench cleaned up. I don't know how many of y'all deal with that, but it's 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 an it's an it's an undoable task, right? It's the what's it, the Kobayashi Maru or whatever from Star Trek. Anyways, um, Somebody, somebody, somebody post that down below if you know what that thing's called. I think that, that sounds kind of right, but not, not like fully on board. Anyway, I'm not a Star Trek person. Um, okay, so I want to talk about cattle. The cattle prices are um, not reflecting what's going on in the market right now. It's really interesting. So you're hearing about um, all these fields, right? These, the, you're hearing in the news reports all this kind of fear porn about the cattle and what's going on and people having to sell cows. And, uh, and, and the, 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 the stockyards are just line after line after line of trucks uh, delivering cattle. And then if you go look at the cattle prices, the cattle prices haven't changed that much. Yeah, they're down a little bit, um, but, uh, but, but respectively of where they've been, you know, they were at all time highs. So of course they're gonna come down a little bit. You know, when, they, when, the, when the, you know, the, 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 the path up on the graph looks kind of like this, right? And so they're just at the top here and they've come down to about there. So, um, so it's not really that much, and uh, so it made me kind of wonder. So I started digging into this more and started kind of figuring out exactly what is going on. And, uh, and, and it is a little bit concerning because it's going to exacerbate, I think, further, and then it's going to uh, cause continual issues on our food supply next year. So what is it, what is, basically what is happening is you have, you, you have a, couple, uh, a couple attributes or a couple uh, activities going on uh, that are combining to create the perfect storm, right? The perfect storm of cattle. And the first one is the drought. So 40, about 44% of the nation, according to drought.gov, about 44% of the nation is currently in a drought. Uh, California, Lake Mead area, I'm sorry, Lake Mead's in Nevada, um, but the supplies to California, so I always say California, I mean Nevada. Um, Lake Mead um, is, Lake Mead is having its problems, right? We've all seen how, how that's down and uh, how that's continuing to get worse. Um, they are the lowest they have been since I believe it was 1983. So um, it is it is pretty bad there. Uh, they they have uh, a holding capacity of what, like 92 million acre feet of. Of, uh, of water that they can hold, and they're at like seven million right now, uh, which is the lowest it has been, and um, and so that's a little bit scary, and that provides a lot of water to that area, to uh, you know Las Vegas area, so it provides water to uh, to Nevada, to California, to Mexico. Uh, I don't understand how that works as far as providing it to Mexico, but uh, and how how that international agreement works there. But yeah, we do pr apparently provide water to Mexico. Um, and then upriver of Lake Mead is another um, another uh, dam that um, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, so they provide water to Lake Mead. They have a contractual obligation. So there's this real complicated thing about um, basically as the water flows down the stream, each uh, e each lake and each river in municipality that controls it has an obligation, and they have to provide so much water per year. Um, and so Lake Mead actually has to send water out. Um, and I don't know when that time frame is that they have to send water out, but to meet their contract, they actually have to send water out. Um, and so hopefully that's been done. <laughs> um, if that has not, then that might exacerbate this problem even more. Um, but so you have, you have this massive drought going on. This drought is causing issues because a lot of places people don't realize, but a lot of uh, dry climate areas like Texas, Wyoming, uh, New Mexico, Nevada, Idaho, uh, water rights are not quite as, as simple as they are here in like Alabama. So Alabama water rights, uh, there's two ways that water rights are done down here in Alabama, but as a general rule, pretty much own the water that's on your property. There are exceptions on what you can do to it because you're not allowed to like molest your neighbor's property with the water in any, in any way. So I can't dam up a river and stop my neighbor from getting water, but I can dam up a river build a pond and then, or, or a stream, I shouldn't say a river, a stream on my property, build a small pond as long as that stream is returned after the construction and, and allows the water flow to continue on my neighbor's property. 
um, then uh, then you, you, all you really have to do is let the neighbor know, hey, I'm doing this. You're going to lose water for a day or two, and uh, while I dam this up and fill the pond, and then you're good to go. Um, so it's it's. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, guys. I just, you know, if as a farmer, I have a general understanding of water rights here. But, uh, but, but a lot of places aren't like that. So, like Wyoming, the state, uh, uh, the state owns the water rights. You have to get permission to drill your wells. Texas, I think, it's kind of the same way where the state owns the water rights. Um, it's a very difficult thing in some of these areas where uh, the states effectively control the water rights, and uh, they. The, they're not super friendly to the farmers. They're friendly to the big corporations like Nestle, right? So Nestle has been overusing their water um, by pretty massive amounts in uh, both Michigan and in uh, California. If you haven't got a Goshen Prepper, he, he's got a, a video on that that goes over the details on that. But they've been using uh, a ton more water than they're allowed to use. And so that, that becomes an issue where you have this cronyism up there. So uh, cronyism in combination with the drought, in combination with it being record droughts, uh, things not getting refilled and replenished like Lake Mead that controls and, and is a reservoir for lots of areas that need water. That Those issues are causing people to have problems with their cattle. Because not only can my cattle not drink, but I'm not growing enough grass. And that is the bigger issue, right? Is if I can't irrigate in like Wyoming, I think if I understand it correctly, you have to be like grandfathered in with the water rights um, or you have to have special water rights that allow you to irrigate. It's really, really restrictive on irrigating your, your land. So basically you're relying on the two inches of annual rainfall that they get out there. Um, so it's very difficult to grow grass in a drought in Wyoming. And uh, so all, you, all, you, all your cows are gonna be eating is sagebrush. And uh, so that, that creates a problem. And, and, and then we move on to, okay, fertilizer costs. Fertilizer costs have just skyrocketed, right? So uh, not, not only doubled, but then they tripled, and now they look like they're about quadruple what they were last year. And that doesn't look like that's getting any better because fertilizer is a petroleum product. So as petroleum prices go up and shipping prices go up, petroleum, uh, fertilizer goes up exponentially past that. So uh, fertilizer goes up. So the cows are not only uh, not able to get as much grass because the water's, uh, water's bad, and, but they're also having trouble getting their fields to grow because those fields are used to fertilizer. Now, if you're an organic farmer like me, that's not that big of a deal, but there's still a net calorie for the U.S., so it affects us all. Uh, but the bigger issue is, is that when you're weaning everybody off of fertilizer, you're like, it's like weaning uh, a crack addict off a of crack, and uh, instead of weaning them, we just went cold turkey and, uh, and took them off of the cocaine. And, and that's the issue that they're having with these pastures. Uh, pastures don't perform well because there's no nutrients in there at all. They have to start the nutrient cycle from the beginning. Now if you have a 5,000 acre farm and you have no good quality nutrients in your soil, you've been reliant on chemical fertilizers and petroleum based fertilizers for the last 60 years, then you've got a problem as far as growing anything. Um, you're, you're really going to struggle. And so you know you you may have to buy some fertilizer to fertilize some fields, but not others. You rotate the cows through to get some nitrogen on these other fields, and so you've got to start that nutrient cycle over because uh, you've been you've been off of it for so long. And uh, that's going to uh, that that that's obviously going to add to the cost and to these to the pressures on these farmers. So what's happening then is these farmers are saying, you know what, I've got 300 cows, and of these 300 cows. Um, I've got water to support 200 of them. I really only have enough pasture to support 100 of them. And of that pasture to support 100 of them, um, I, I can't irrigate it this year because the, the state has told me with the drought, I'm not allowed to run more you know, past this water. So I really need to be down to 70 cows. So we go from 300 to 70 cows. Well, what do I have to do with, that, uh, with those other cows, right? The, the 230 cows, well, I have to sell them. And I have a couple options. I can uh, sell them to private individuals. I can sell them to, there's big companies that will buy them up um, and feed them out. You can sell directly to feed lots if you have those relationships. Generally, you go to the cattle auctions. That's where most people go to sell. We don't go to the cattle auctions because we raise heritage breed livestock, and heritage breed livestock will not sell at cattle auctions. Um, so we don't, we, they, they, they just won't be worth anything. We wouldn't get, we'd get next to nothing for them. So um, we, don't, we don't deal with it. But, the majority of people, that's where they would sell it. They would sell at a cattle auction. And so for those of y'all that aren't in cattle and you don't understand this, you have a couple of different types of operation with cattle. You have a cow-calf operation. These are people that breed, raise out the calves, have weaning time, and then they sell them as, as feeder calves. Um, and they might sell them to a backgrounder that's gonna put them out on grass. And that, that, that guy's gonna 
uh, rotate them around and put some weight on them, <clears throat> and then he's going to take them and he's going to sell them to a feedlot where they're going to be finished for about 90 days on grain uh, or corn or whatever. So uh, that's kind of the general operation. You can combine those at any level. Some people do it start to finish. They're cow calf and they're the backgrounder and they're the feedlot as well. Uh, some people don't do feedlots because it's grass fed. Uh, there's all sorts of different exceptions, but that's kind of the general process in a simplest form. And so, so with these with these cows, each step of that way, everybody is going down. Everybody is saying because all of them are, excuse me, reliant on these uh, on these processes. So the cow calf because he's, he's mostly going to be grass fed and, and hay and uh, maybe a little bit of grain in the winter time because that cow calf operation is reliant on the, on the water and the fertilizer to grow the grass, he's down. The background is dealing with the same issue. The feedlot, even at the end, he's dealing with the people that were growing the corn and the grain at the beginning, so his price of corn and grain had gone up if he's not growing his own. So all the prices through all three of those stages have gone up. Now, and that makes it, and that, so that's making it more difficult to where only the larger guys uh, can do it. And those guys usually are full-time operations where they have everything. They have every step of the way. A lot of these bigger, bigger, big, big farms, I'm talking like, you know, 20, 30,000 acre farms, they have cow-calf backgrounders and um, the finishing, they do it all. And so they don't need to buy up. And, and so what you're getting is you're getting these, uh, these guys that are specific feedlot guys and they're the ones buying things up. Well. They're now getting flooded on the market, and there's so many cows for them to choose from. They're going to uh, to be able to, at this point in time, start negotiating their price down even further. Um, and as the Texas price comes down, so too will the rest of the country. Because what will end up happening is people, because the average cow travels like 1,200 miles before it reaches your dinner plate. Remember that. Most of this stuff is not, they're not staying local. They're getting shipped all over the place. And so what's going to happen is these guys are going to say, listen, it is cheaper for me to buy a cow in Texas ship him to my feedlot in Virginia and at that point in time I can um, I, I, I can still raise him out and it's cheaper than me buying at the local feed or at the local cattle, cattle auction here and that at a certain price point that becomes a reality I don't know when that price point is but as the Texas prices continue to drop and Texas having so many cows that's going to become more of an issue but realize it's not just Texas it's everywhere that's dealing with the drought right now 44 percent of the nation so Texas might be getting the news right now, they might be hit the worst, but that's because they're a big cattle state, they have a ton of cattle, right? And um, so, so it, it, it will certainly affect the rest of the nation and everybody in areas like I'm at, eventually they're going to say, well, hey, I can get it cheaper if I could buy from Texas and ship it here, even though we're not in a drought. Uh, so it's gonna affect my cattle prices here as well. So there are uh, avenues of this that are going to continue to affect you and uh, this feed, the, the, the cost of the cow is going to continue to probably go down. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it'll go back up anytime soon. Um, I think that really we're on a long term of it declining. Um, whether that's going to be a sudden drop off or a long term decline over the next year or two, I don't truly know. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to think that it's going to be a lot more sudden uh, over the next probably three to six months and then uh, after that we'll probably start uh, gradually leveling out again as we get you more used to this cycle. Uh, but again, this is, this is not a short-term problem. Uh, it, it doesn't get fixed with one good heavy rain. It gets fixed with a rainy season that restocks the, 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 the reservoirs, uh, that gets some grass growing. Uh, but even then still, we're still dealing with the higher fertilizer prices. So all of these are, um, are, are exacerbating the problem with the cows. So, this is what you need to be prepared for. Uh, if you have not already gotten your lock on your beef, you need to do so. Uh, you need to get with a small farmer. Let me just put it this way. With our small farm here, and we sell directly to consumers, we are completely booked out. I have more orders for beef than I can fill. I have more orders for beef than I can support cows on my property right now. And I've told everybody, basically the only way that I could do it right now is if I were to charge you a 60% deposit uh, for your for your cow, buy all the hay for that cow right now as I do it because I don't know what the price is going to be in six months, and buy all that hay, hay and feed and everything for that cow right this minute. It's the only way I could do it, and uh, and it would be very expensive for you. So there, it, it's going to continue to go up. Uh, it's going to continue to be a problem. So. The, normally, you know, we take a small deposit. Um, but we we but we generally buy our feed for our entire our, our, our entire herd here, 
Uh, but you know they're 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 raised out on pasture, so our feed costs are supplemented with the pasture. If I were to buy a cow right now, I'd be feeding the entire thing like it was a feedlot cow, and uh, and, and so that, uh, that that there's no way to do this cheaply anymore. All of a sudden, I have to just buy all the feed to take this cow from 300 pounds to 1,100 pounds, and uh, that that is a, a very difficult task to do when you're talking that you know you're feeding what two two and a half percent of their body weight a day. In, in feed, uh, that's between hay and grains, that, that is obviously very expensive and so there's no way to get around this and, uh, and, and to try to offset this system. The fact of the matter is that beef is going to be less, there's going to be less of it on the market, which is going to drive the price up, those, those high prices are, are going to continue to get up until they give, uh, until the government decides that they want to get involved with things like price control. As soon as you start seeing price control, that's time to really be scared. Anyways, guys, I will let y'all go. I really appreciate y'all watching. We're going to get this video out to you right now. And um, I really, really hope you guys subscribe and like the channel. Um, it does help us out a lot if you go down and like the video. And leave in a comment or two. Helps helps the algorithm out. We have been so blessed with everything that our subscribers have done. We can't, uh, can't thank you guys enough. Uh, so we will catch y'all tomorrow morning.